Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. The focus of our session is how parties recover their litigation spend in Scotland, drawing some comparisons with the system in England and Wales. Your speakers today are Thomas McFarlane and me, Daisy Bovingdon. We are both solicitors in the Commercial Disputes and Regulation Division at Shepherd and Wedderburn. Thomas specialises in Scottish disputes, in particular professional negligence, shareholder and director disputes, and contractual and delictual claims. I am a member of the Commercial and International Disputes team with a focus on contracts, professional negligence, and intellectual property. So an outline of today's session is shown on the slide. We will discuss some potential costs benefits of bringing a claim in Scotland if you have a choice of forum. We'll summarise the legal frameworks in both jurisdictions, look at recoverability, the awards themselves, we'll look at tenders and Part 36 offers and their impact on costs awards, how costs and expenses are calculated, costs budgeting in England and Wales, and what the future looks like for the expenses rules in Scotland. We hope that by the end of this webinar, those of you who are familiar with the system in one of the jurisdictions will be more confident in navigating the other. There is a chat box on your screen. Please ask any questions by typing in the box. We will answer questions either at the end or if there isn't time, we will contact you directly following the session. Before I hand over to Thomas to begin the formal session, we wanted to let you know that Shepherd and Wedderburn has recently secured a funding portfolio deal with litigation funders, Burford Capital. The arrangement allows commercial clients the opportunity to access funding to pursue or defend a claim in England and Wales. In essence, this product brings no wing, no fee, no risk to large commercial disputes. As a result of the portfolio, we are able to provide access to a simple product that is underpinned by a damages-based agreement with the external security provided by third-party funding. A link to some information about the offering is at the top of the screen. If you have any questions or are interested in finding out how you might take advantage of it, please let us know. We are currently the only Legal 100 firm promoting this offering to clients, so we believe the arrangement is unique in the market. Third party funding is also available for Scottish disputes, and if this is of interest, please get in touch. I'll now hand over to Thomas to open the formal training with some points to consider when you have a choice of forum. Thank you, Daisy. So, in general, litigation costs, or rather expenses as they are known in Scotland, are thought to be lower here than in England and Wales, at least in London anyway, and that is as a result of lower court fees and solicitor costs. This is not always the case, but bringing a claim in Scotland can result in a significant cost saving for parties in some situations. Scotland is therefore a jurisdiction worth bearing in mind when you have a choice of forum. One example of an instant cost saving that can be made by raising your claim in Scotland rather than England and Wales is where, where you have the choice is the court fees payable to kickstart the action. In Scotland, that is called having your claim signated, and for any claim raised in the court of session, no matter the value, if that is £10,000 or £10 million, the court fee payable is only £300. That is significantly less than in England and Wales, where if a claim is over £10,000, the court dues payable to bring the claim are 5% of the sum sued for, and that is up to a maximum of £10,000 for claims in excess of £200,000. So moving on then, where do we find the rules governing costs or expenses? The fundamental cost rules in England and Wales are set out in parts 44 to 47 of the Civil Procedure Rules, or CPR as it is commonly known. In Scotland, the rules are found at Chapter 42 of the Rules of the Court of Session, or RCS for short. 
um, and case law. <coughs> in both jurisdictions, the general rule is that expenses follow success, and as such, the unsuccessful party usually pays the winner's costs. In England and Wales, that is enshrined in CPR Rule uh, 44.2, whereas in Scotland it is noted in the decision Bond against British Railways Board uh, 1972. Although, of course, determining who has been successful in an action is not always straightforward. Moving on then to consider uh, recovery. Um, typically, a successful party who has been awarded expenses by a Scottish court can only expect to recover around 50 to 60 per cent of the fees and outlays they have actually incurred. As such, clients must be made aware that the expenses they will be awarded, even if they are wholly successful in pursuing or defending an action, will not typically be anywhere near their actual spend. So clients need to budget for that accordingly. So how about cost recovery in England and Wales? In England, there are a variety of bases upon which cost orders are made. If costs are awarded on a standard basis, the successful party can expect to recover around 70% of their costs. The focus is on reasonableness in the context of the action and proportionality of the cost to the value of the claim. The courts also have the power to try to influence party spend by making cost management orders, or CMOs. CMOs are a mechanism by which litigation spend is reviewed and hopefully managed throughout the process. We will cover these later in the session. So timing of awards. In both jurisdictions, costs are routinely awarded following the various hearings that take place throughout litigation. For example, against a party who brings an application in England and Wales that is dismissed, or where a party's motion in Scotland fails. It is important to bear in mind that a judge may award no cost to either party, thereby eliminating any ability to recover. Importantly, both jurisdictions have additional rules, allowing judges to increase the liability of a paying party beyond the basic award. This might happen where, for example, the court is persuaded that the party has conducted their case in an incompetent or an unreasonable manner. I'll now hand over to Thomas, who will begin by explaining how expenses are awarded in Scotland. So in Scotland, the court has a discretion to choose the scale of an award of expenses. <clears throat> The two scales available are either one party and party or two solicitor and client. The usual finding of expenses is on a party and party basis, with awards between solicitor and client being rare. Party and party expenses are those expenses which are considered reasonable for conducting the litigation in a proper manner. This covers more than the absolute essential steps in the litigation but excludes work considered above and beyond what is necessary, or work related to providing a client with a high quality service. Solicitor and client expenses, on the other hand, cover work done for the client's benefit, and not only that work strictly necessary to advance the action. These can be added to the award in certain circumstances. The relevant principles for determining which scale of expenses will apply are summarised in the decision the key against the Scottish Ministers, uh, which is a 2006 decision. The three principles are as follows. Number one, in the normal case, expenses are awarded on a party and party scale. Secondly, where one of the parties has conducted the litigation incompetently or unreasonably and thereby caused the other party unnecessary expense, the court can impose as a sanction against such conduct an award of expenses on solicitor and client scale. And thirdly, in considering the reasonableness of a party's conduct, the court can take into account all relevant circumstances, including the party's behaviour before the action commenced, the adequacy of a party's preparation for the action, the strengths or otherwise of a party's position, 
on the substantive merits of the action, the use of a court action for an improper purpose, and the way in which a party has used court procedure, for example, to progress or delay the resolution of the dispute. If an award is ultimately made on the agent-client scale, then the party is much more likely to recover a sum closer to 100% of their actual spend. However, such awards are extremely rare, given that it must be shown that the paying party acted unreasonably or incompetently. So now I'll pass you over to Daisy, who will explain how costs are awarded in England and Wales. Thanks, Thomas. So, when a party is awarded costs, the court decides whether costs are fixed or ought to be awarded on a summary or detailed basis, and CPR 44.6 is vital here. Fixed recoverable costs. It is open to the court to award costs on a fixed basis in lower value claims. Lord Justice Jackson has recently carried out a review to see where the application of fixed costs might be extended. The final report with recommendations was issued in July this year. The report proposes that fixed recoverable costs should be extended to all fast track cases and that a new intermediate track is introduced for certain claims with a value up to £100,000. The report also recommends a voluntary pilot of a capped costs regime for business cases up to a quarter of a million pounds in value. The objective of the review process is um, to make sure that we have streamlined procedures and costs are capped. So the report marks Lord Justice Jackson's second review of the rules to control costs of civil litigation. It will be interesting to see which of the recommendations are implemented. So summary or detailed assessment. If the court decides that the award should not be restricted to fixed costs, then the factors taken into account in choosing a summary or detailed assessment are set out in paragraph 9.1 of Practice Direction 44. As a generality, the, short should, the court should make a summary assessment of costs at the conclusion of a fast-track case or at the conclusion of any other hearing which has not lasted longer than a day, unless there is good reason not to do so. It is the duty of the parties and their legal representatives to assist the judge in making a summary assessment of costs, including preparing a statement of costs. Failure to comply with this direction without reasonable excuse will be taken into account by the court when it makes its order. So what about detailed assessment? When detailed assessment of costs is ordered, the order is usually X shall pay Y's costs to be assessed if not agreed. Parties generally agree costs. However, if this fails, then the receiving party prepares a bill of costs and serves it on the paying party. The matter will go to a detailed assessment hearing conducted by a cost judge who will assess the costs that the paying party must pay. This is akin to the taxation process in Scotland, discussed later. An English court will also decide whether to make its award on a standard or indemnity basis. Although calculated in a different way, the purpose is similar to the party party or solicitor client scales used in Scotland which Thomas has discussed. So standard costs. The default position is that costs will be assessed on the standard basis, which is often more favourable to the paying party. When assessing standard costs, the court will eliminate those costs which it considers unreasonable or disproportionate to the matters in issue. If there is any doubt as to whether the costs are reasonably or proportionately incurred, the court must decide the matter in favour of the paying party. In making its decision, the court must have regard to all the circumstances of the case, including the party's conduct, value, the importance of the matter to the parties, its complexity, any skill and specialist knowledge required, the time spent on the matter, whereabouts work was undertaken, 
and the last approved or agreed budget, if a budget is in place. So what about indemnity costs? As a general rule, indemnity costs are awarded where the court considers that the receiving party should be compensated for the other party's wrongful conduct. This is similar to the unreasonable or incompetent test in relation to solicitor and client scale expenses in Scotland that Thomas has mentioned. Another reason might be as a result of a Part 36 offer made by either party during the course of the litigation, something which we'll consider later. There is no specific reference to proportionality where costs are assessed on the indemnity basis although the court will, of course, have regard to the overriding objective to deal with cases justly and at a proportionate cost. For indemnity costs, any doubt as to whether the costs are reasonably incurred is resolved in favour of the receiving party. This is the opposite approach taken to costs on a standard basis. Whether indemnity costs are ordered is a matter for the court's discretion. There is no exhaustive exhaustive list of circumstances under which an order on the indemnity basis will be made. Case law does, however, tend to show that indemnity costs are usually ordered to penalise a paying party where there has been some culpability, for example, an abusive process, unreasonable behaviour, dishonesty or impropriety, delaying the procedural timetable failure to comply with the pre-action protocol or a case management order, unreasonably refusing to settle or engage in ADR, pursuing a far-fetched claim, making serious allegations without any foundation in evidence, or exerting undue commercial pressure on the other side. So there are a whole host of reasons why indemnity costs might be awarded. In essence, the court awards indemnity costs in circumstances where the conduct of the paying party is out of the norm. And there's an important case on this point that is shown on the slide. Now I will hand over to Thomas, who will discuss additional fee awards in Scotland, which is another way in which a party can seek to recover more than standard expenses. Thanks, Daisy. So aside from moving for expenses on the agent client scale, a successful party can also move for an additional fee. Indeed, a party in Scotland can move for both, so long as it does not result in a higher recovery than their actual spend. An additional fee must be justified by reference to the seven possible heads laid down in Rule of Court 42.14. Those include the complexity and or value of the claim, the number of documents involved, the level of specialist knowledge required, and the overall time and labour required from the solicitor. These are similar fact to the factors taken into account by the courts in England and Wales in determining whether costs were reasonably and proportionately incurred as part of a cost assessment on the standard basis. Now, for each of the seven heads awarded by the Scottish Court, the successful party will be awarded a percentage uplift in its overall expenses with each head having a different weighting. Generally, from our recent experience, this will be at least 10% per head, but can be as much as 25 to 30% for certain heads. We have recently secured both additional fee awards and agent-client expenses on behalf of clients. And having considered how expenses and costs are awarded, we will now look at effect judicial offers of settlement can have on expenses or costs awards in both jurisdictions. So I'll pass you back to Daisy, who will discuss those now. Thank you, Thomas. So Part 36 offers in England and Wales, or tenders in Scotland, can have a significant impact on the level of costs or expenses awarded. In England and Wales, Part 36 offers are types of offers to settle a dispute for which the rules relating to the process, including the offer, withdrawal, and acceptance, are set out in the CPR. They can be made by claimant or defendant and have significant cost implications, which are explicitly set out in the rules. Part 36 offers are without prejudice, 
and therefore not seen by the court until after it has decided the case. They can be used by both claimants and defendants to firstly try to persuade the other party to settle and secondly to try to limit their exposure to the other side's costs in a number of circumstances. The rules contained in Part 36 are complex and so this section only highlights the main point. Firstly, the defendant's offer. The fundamental rule is that if a claimant accepts a defendant's Part 36 offer within the relevant period, usually 21 days from the date it is served, the defendant must pay the claimant's costs up to the date of acceptance. So, if a defendant offers £2 million to settle and this is accepted, the defendant normally pays the claimant the £2 million plus the claimant's costs up to the date of acceptance. If the claimant does not accept the Part 36 offer, wins at trial, but is awarded less than the amount of the Part 36 offer, the claimant will generally need to pay the defendant's costs from the end of the relevant period plus interest. So the incentive provided to both parties to settle is clear here. What about the claimant's offer? If a defendant accepts a claimant's Part 36 offer, the defendant generally pays the claimant's costs up to the date of acceptance. So, if the claimant offers to settle for £2 million, the defendant will still pay the claimant's costs up to the date of that acceptance. However, if the defendant does not accept the offer and the claimant is awarded more than the amount of the offer at trial, the claimant may be entitled to recover interest on any damages awarded up to 10% above the base rate, together with costs on an indemnity basis plus interest again at 10% above the base rate on those costs from the last date after which the defendant was capable of accepting the offer. This can have significant cost implications for a defendant who loses an action having failed to accept a Part 36 offer. It's important to note that the purpose of awarding indemnity costs in these circumstances is to encourage parties to settle. It is not a punitive measure relating to the party's conduct, and this was confirmed in the case of McPhilmy and Times uh, sorry, and Times Newspapers Limited, number two of 2001. So the timing of making and accepting a Part 36 offer really can be crucial to your cost exposure. Now, Part 36 offers are not available in Scotland. Instead, judicial settlements are advanced by way of minutes of tender. <clears throat> These are regulated by case law precedents rather than formal procedural rules like in England and Wales. Like Part 36 offers though, to be effective, a tender must contain a settlement offer and an unqualified offer of expenses to the date of the tender. And again, similarly uh, to Part 36 offers in England and Wales, they are not seen by the court until after the case has been dealt with and uh, the court is dealing with questions of expenses. Now, the treatment of tenders made by defenders is rather straightforward. If the court's award in the case is higher than the tender, then expenses are awarded as normal, i.e. the tender has no effect. If, however, the court's award is lower than the tender, then expenses are only awarded as normal until the date of the tender, after which the pursuer cannot recover their expenses and not only that, they must pay the defender's expenses during that period. So there is, in effect, a double whammy for the pursuer who fails to beat the tender. The rationale here is that the pursuer should have accepted the tender as a reasonable settlement and therefore bears the expenses burden for the continuation of the action. Unlike in England and Wales, there is no 21-day period for acceptance and a tender can be withdrawn at any time. Also, the date of the tender in Scotland is not actually the date it was issued, but rather the date on which it ought reasonably to have been accepted, with the pursuer allowed a reasonable time to consider a tender. However, there is little case law guidance on how long a reasonable period is, 
but the later the tender and the course of an action, it is likely to increase the time allowed for its consideration. As well as uh, tenders, uh, in Scotland following a recent change to the rules, it is also possible for the pursuer to make a formal settlement offer, which is known as a pursuer's offer. The case will settle if the defender accepts the pursuer's offer and will have to pay the principal sum offered, inclusive of interest and the pursuer's expenses to the date of the offer. Where the court is satisfied that the pursuer's offer was accepted late, the defender is found liable for interest on the principal sum from the date of the offer and for payment of an additional sum of expenses to the pursuer. That additional payment is a 50% uplift on the pursuer's expenses for the period following the date of the offer. The rules also provide for the defender to be found liable for payment of the same additional 50% uplift in expenses to the pursuer where an offer is not accepted and where any court award is the same or better than the level of the pursuer's offer. So, once you have your order from the court in your favour, how do you go about calculating your costs or expenses? When a detailed assessment has been ordered in England and Wales and agreement cannot be reached, a bill of costs is prepared by the successful party and served on the paying party. If settlement cannot be negotiated, the matter will be determined by a cost judge at an assessment hearing. Generally, that process is very similar to the process in Scotland, whereby the successful party serves a judicial account of expenses on the unsuccessful party which is drafted by a specialist law accountant. In Scotland, the judicial account must be served within four months of the final order from the court dealing with expenses. The unsuccessful party will be given a chance to lodge any points of objection, and if settlement is not agreed, the matter will proceed to a diet of taxation before the auditor of court, which is essentially a hearing. Now, the Auditor of Court is independent of the Court, having been appointed by the Scottish Ministers to independently determine the expenses in an action. At the conclusion of the taxation, the Auditor issues a report that is binding on the parties, although there is a right of appeal to the Court. If an additional fee is awarded by the judge in Scotland, then the Auditor of Court takes that into consideration in his report, applying the appropriate percentage uplift to the total solicitor's fee element, calculated as being recoverable. However, in reality, the vast majority of accounts are agreed between the parties, neither usually having the appetite to incur more time and cost in having the matter decided by the auditor of court. Now, at this stage, it is worthwhile considering how a judicial accountant in Scotland is actually prepared and how that ultimately affects recoverability is effectively split into two separate parts. A calculation of the solicitor's fee element, which is recoverable, which is either on the solicitor and client or party and party scale. And then secondly, it deals with disbursements, which are recoverable, including any counsel's fees and expert witness fees. Now, the solicitor's fee element is calculated by reference to a judicial rate, which is prescribed by statute and must be followed by the auditor. Currently, that rate is £156 per hour. Now, for the in-house lawyers listening, you will no, no doubt have considered the tricky question of whether or not your own fees, as well as any solicitors instructed by you, are recoverable. Now, in principle, it is possible, although there is no real judicial guidance on the point. To ensure best prospects of recovery, it is important that in-house lawyers keep a fully itemised breakdown of the time they spend on a dispute and the work undertaken. However, that said, duplication of work as between you and the instructed solicitors will not be permitted as the account is prepared as though only one solicitor was involved. Moving on then to consider disbursements, then in Scotland, council fees are almost always recoverable, although the amount can be challenged. For expert witnesses, on the other hand, which are known as skilled persons under the court rules, 
they must be certified before the court before their costs are recoverable from the paying party. Now, normally that is just a formality, but it is uh, open to challenge. So, one major difference between the two jurisdictions is that in England and Wales, courts have extensive case and cost management powers. These are contained in Part 3 of the CPR. There are as yet no equivalent cost provisions in Scotland. However, we expect cost management to become a feature of the Scottish legal system in the coming years. So the purpose of cost management is that the, that the court should manage, firstly, the steps to be taken, and secondly, the costs to be incurred by the parties to litigation. The cost management rules play an important part in trying to achieve the overall, overall objective to deal with cases justly and at proportionate cost. So what is the effect of cost management orders on the recovery of costs? If a CMO is made, the courts will then control the party's budget in respect of recoverable costs. When the court assesses costs following final determination, it will look at the last approved or agreed budget. It is worth noting that the approved budget is staged. So, for example, if you have an approved budget of £100,000 and you have allocated 40000 for disclosure, if your total costs are 90,000, but you have spent 50,000 on disclosure, recovery on the disclosure aspect will be restricted to the 40,000 pounds allocated to that phase within your budget. The cost management order means there are no great surprises for the paying party. They have had prior notification of the likely extent of their cost liability in the event they are unsuccessful in the action. There was an interesting case on this topic in June this year. That's Harrison and University Hospitals Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust of 2017. And uh, the citation is on the screen if anyone would like to read it. So in this case, the Court of Appeal confirmed that once a CMO has been made, the approved or agreed budget is binding on a subsequent detailed assessment. The budgeted figure should not be departed from, upwards or downwards, unless good reason can be shown, and this follows the terms of CPR 3.18. The individual costs judge has the discretion to determine whether there is a good reason to depart from the budget, having regard to the circumstances of an individual case. It's also worth mentioning that costs incurred prior to the making of the costs management order fall to be assessed in the usual way. Now, as Daisy has said, we don't have cost budgeting or cost management in this form in Scotland, although it has been thought for a number of years that a move towards this is inevitable. However, as yet, there has been no concrete plans to introduce it. There had been a review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland by Sheriff Principal Taylor, published in September 2013 which followed on from the Scottish Civil Court Review by Lord Gill in September 2009. Now, Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended various changes to the expenses system in Scotland, including a move towards cost budgeting in order to reduce the gap between recoverability and actual spend that exists in Scotland, but most of his recommendations are yet to be implemented. The Scottish Civil Justice Council is currently undertaking a comprehensive rewrite of Scotland's existing civil procedure rules and are working to develop recommendations on expenses. However, a rewrite of the rules on expenses falls within the remit of a later work stream, and there is no indication as of yet as to when work on that will actually commence. So we can expect the system in Scotland to remain as is for the foreseeable future at least. Now, today's webinar has been a, a whirlwind tour of the rules determining how you recover your litigation spend in the two jurisdictions, but if anyone else has any further questions, then please type them in the chat box now, or alternatively, just send us an email after the webinar and we'll answer your questions directly. So that concludes part one of our two-part series, and thank you all for taking the time to tune in and listen. Your speakers today have been Thomas McFarlane and me, Daisy Bovingdon. We hope you will join us for part two on enforcement. That webinar covers 
recognition of a Scottish award in England and Wales and abroad, and how to enforce a foreign judgment in Scotland. We will be in touch soon to let you know the arrangements for that session. As Thomas has said, if you would like to discuss anything arising out of today's webinar or are interested in learning more about our funding portfolio offering, please contact us using the details on the slide. Thank you and good afternoon.